I look at the folks on Zoom, to the folks on the Facebook live stream, as well as the folks watching on YouTube and listening on the Bully Pulpit podcast. We appreciate you. I'm going to say a few words to introduce us all and explain what's happening today. It's a bit different, so it, might, it needs an explanation. You are here to see an intergenerational dialogue. So everyone that you see here is either a student at USC or the parent of a student at USC. All of them are very much involved in politics, and they're going to talk about what they have in common and what they don't. And so we have given them a variety of cards. They don't know what card they're going to see. Each card has a question on the back of it. So they're going to pick up a card and ask that question to their family member. And their family member will have one to two minutes to respond. So it's going to be kind of fun and, and different. Before they start, I wanted to just say briefly that my name is Kami. I'm the executive director of the USC Center for the Political Future. And I wanted to give you a couple of statistics to contextualize what's kind of special about this. Statistic one, in 1950, there was a survey done of parents and asked if they would mind if their son or daughter married someone of the opposing political party. And in 1950, nobody cared. The average across both parties was around 4%. Flash forward 50 years later, in 2010, similar study, parents, would you mind? Any guesses what that number was? It was around, around 40%, around 40%. Uh, so it's it's a quite a dramatic leap that we've gone to. Now, that was parents finding if their son or daughter married someone of the opposing political party. But keep in mind that another study that just came out in 2020 showed does it matter if you grow up in a house with Democrat parents, are you more likely to become a Democrat? The opposite is in fact true. You are less likely to follow in your parents' political ideology than your child. Uh, and so if you don't want your son or daughter to marry someone of the opposing political party, then just keep doing what you're doing and they're <laughs> gonna end up on your side any, anyways. Uh, so so uh, that is some, some contextualizing stats. I wanted you guys to know before we leave today, we brought a bunch Gifts you're welcome to take with you. They're mugs, books, buttons, these uh, that represent some element of our programming at the Center for the Political Future. Uh, I am now going to turn it over to our esteemed uh, guests, and I'm going to ask them, going from Professor Auerbach down, if you can introduce yourself and then point out your family member across the table. We'll have 30 to 60 second introductions till we get to the end with Katie, and then It'll go back to Art to ask question whatever you pick. I actually have to read what's on the card, right? You have to read what's on it. Just make it up. No one will know. <laughs> okay, great. Buddy, I'm Art Auerbach. I'm a professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations. Um, one of the other roles I play is I'm also the internship director at the Unruh Institute of Politics, which is part of the Center for the Political Future. It's a lot of words to say I help kids uh, get placed in internships, political and otherwise. Uh, you know, here at USC during the academic year and during the summer. And that is my beautiful daughter on the end, Katie. And we'll look forward to hearing from her in a sec. Well, thank you. And um, I am uh, honored to be here with, with all of you. And, and thank you, Kami, and the Center for the Political um, for hosting and, and sponsoring this. Um, uh, most important, I'm um, Alexis Reyes' dad. And um, I, uh, I started life as a, uh, a dairy farmer in the Central Valley, ended up in the state legislature in 1982, and uh, later uh, chaired the Coastal Commission in California and was director of state parks when uh, Gray Davis, my classmate in the state assembly, was elected governor. So uh, that's uh, kind of what uh, what I've been doing. I'm a, a partner and founder of California Strategies, uh, which is a political public affairs firm that uh, operates all over the state. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am the proud dad of Ion Kunalakis, who is a sophomore here at USC, studying international relations, which is my field, which was a surprise that he decided to follow in my field. Uh, I uh, practice uh, international relations at the Hoover Institution, where I've been a fellow for the last decade. Uh, and prior to that, I was a foreign correspondent, uh, mainly in Eastern Europe, covering the fall and collapse of communism in the Soviet Union, where I lived for a while. And uh, the reason I think I'm sort of part of the political scene is not just because I covered international politics, but I happen to be married to California's Lieutenant Governor, Eleni, who I think is gonna be putting questions up on the board. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, awesome. So my name is uh, Ian Kunalakis. I'm a double major in international relations and Chinese, definitely following in my parents' footsteps a little bit with the international relations bit. Uh, but they also forced me into a Chinese school at a young age. So yeah. <laughs> Chinese. Um, and yeah, I look forward to talking about that. Amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Alexis Arreyes. Um, I am a political science uh, major here at USC, minor in Middle Eastern Studies. I'm in my fifth year, finishing up my final semester. Um, during my time at USC, I served as student body president, uh, which is a phenomenal experience. Um, and as of now, I'm currently working on one of the mayoral campaigns here in Los Angeles. Um, so getting ready for November 8th. And um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. So I'll over to you, Katie. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Auerbach. I am the daughter of Arthur Auerbach, who has traumatized many students with horrible midterms over the past years. Wasn't that and, bad? <laughs> and uh, last spring, I graduated from USC with a um, well, I majored in journalism and my in English creative writing, and now I am pursuing my master's in public relations and advertising. I'm very passionate about politics and combining both my interest in creative and um, storytelling, and I work in political consulting here in downtown Los Angeles. And I just wanted to add also, that's great. I, I also have a USC connection in that I was a mid-career fellow at the Annenberg School oh. in international journalism. So that's awesome. Fight on. And you've been, invited, you've been invited back. I've been invited back. Thanks. All right. Do I have the, the go ahead? All right. Here we go for lucky number 15. I don't know why. We'll see what this says. All right. So Katie answers it, right? Is that how we do this? All right, Kate. Uh, who's been the most influential person in your career? <laughs> uh, so I'm set up. Set up. I'm just set, saying. Set up. Stack, stack. <laughs> I swear it's what it said. Terrified. <laughs> Promoted. <laughs> I think you'd be honored to choose one person. Well I done. just have to give it to. Growing up, I was I'm a Trojan legacy. My mom attended USC in eighty graduated eighty four. No. Ninety. All right. Anyways, but Growing up a Trojan legacy, I've had the honor of coming to this campus ever since I was a little girl. This has always been my dream school, and my parents have worked very hard to get to where they are today, and I'm, I've caved into politics, and I'm super interested in it because of dad, so I'm very grateful for both of them, mom and dad. Oh. Wow. Good job. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> All right, uh, Rusty, I think you're up. Let's go with 11 over here. Okay. What did you want to be when you grew up? Do you what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you always know you wanted to do something political? It's a great question. Uh, you know, from about the ages of four to probably twelve, I was convinced I was going to be uh, in the Central Intelligence Agency. I really wanted <laughs> to be a spy. It was a big thing. I'm sure you'll remember that, Dad. Um, and I think it was. I wasn't sure that I wanted to do anything political in particular. I think it was sort of as I started to get into middle school, high school, and um, sort of, I think, started to pay a lot closer attention to the world, you know, around me and um, just kind of the complexities and issues that, that we're seeing all around us. But um, definitely caught the bug, I think, from a very young age, always had a, a big appreciation for it. And so, yeah, something that developed there. Okay. Well, since we're at USC, we're number one. Yeah. And so I thought I would go with this one. Ian, how do you communicate with people that you totally disagree with on most issues? Respectfully, yes. first of all, that's a really important one. But I think one thing that my parents have really taught me is to uh, listen to everyone, uh, hear them out. Um, and if I disagree with them, that's uh, something that can be talked about. But it's always in a respectful manner. Uh, when I was growing up, my mom was the United States ambassador to Hungary, and that was during the rise of Viktor Orban. So if she can be the United States ambassador while Viktor Orban is the new prime minister, I mean, I, I think I can talk to someone who has a little bit of a different outlook than I do. <laughs> I think you're up. Oh, yeah. Get to All right, that was a jump. <laughs> um, what was your first job in politics, Dad? Uh, so that's an easy one because I remember I, I walked – uh, precincts uh, for uh, an assembly member in Northern California named Lou Pappin. And um, yeah, that's 
basically what he did. I would, you know, at 12, 13 years old. And then uh, he was a family friend. He was my parents' uh, insurance broker. Greek and so he was Greek American as well, uh, <laughs> from originally from Massachusetts. And uh, he ended up becoming um, the dean of the assembly and uh, was really very influential, so much so that his daughters, so in politics today, one uh, having been the mayor of Milbrae, the other the mayor of San Mateo, and the one who's the mayor of Milbrae is his brother's godmother. <laughs> so <laughs> politics can have longevity. Oh, sorry, this is up, up yeah. me. All right, Dad, you ready for this one? <laughs> okay, great question. Um, what sparked your initial interest in politics? You know, I thought about that that many, uh, many times. And um, uh, my father was always interested in politics, although he wasn't very good at it. Um, <laughs> but he was a rising star in the growing Azorian community in the Central Valley. He was a very successful dairy farmer, and the Democratic Party was reaching out to these, these kinds of um, people in the community. And he was a delegate to the 1960 Democratic Convention dedicated to uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, or committed to John F. K Kennedy. And he, uh, he went to the convention with my mother. That was the big highlight. We still have all the memorabilia that they brought yeah. back from, from that convention. And uh, then a little later that year, um, we lived out on a ranch, so we had a mule. Dad was parents were or my my dad was a was a hunter so we had a pack mule and kennedy was coming through california on the kennedy special um a, a train ride an old-fashioned political train ride and we washed the mule up in the cow corral loaded him into a trailer took him to merced and led him through the streets of merced to the train station where we saw, saw that son of the commonwealth that was soon to become president of the united states 28 years later, as a state assemblyman, I got to introduce and tell that story to um, another son of the Commonwealth, Michael Dukakis. I was in the state assembly and introduced him at that same train station. He wasn't quite as successful. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Nice. Who are your political heroes? Well, you know, I was I was uh, born in the '60s, um, and was born in the year John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And my mom uh, was a die in the wool hardcore Democrat, although her friends would sort of give her a hard time to say she was wealthy enough to be a Kennedy Democrat. Um, but that made a big influence on me. There was always politics, you know, in our house, and because of that, I always sort of thought of. John F. Kennedy and Bob Bobby Kennedy, of course, is sort of the standard bearers. Um, you know, it's I think in this day and time of uh, hyperpolarization, it's very easy just to stay in your lane and 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 just think that way. I respect um, a lot of Republicans. I really do. Um, I respected Ronald Reagan. I didn't agree with his policies, but I could have conversations with people that supported him. Um, the same for, you know, H.W., uh, Bush, and so forth and so on. So, uh, you know, if I had to pick my my liberal uh, influence, it's probably John Kennedy. But if I had to pick my more conservative side, it, it might very well be uh, someone like Thomas Jefferson, someone who saw through politics for the betterment of the country, which is what I think we need a lot more of. You know, all this bickering is, is ludicrous. Sorry. I got on my soapbox. I'll stop. And you get to ask the question. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. Katie, why do politics matter to you? <laughs> politics matter to me because uh, from very young age, mom and dad taught me to stand up for myself and for what I believe in. And I hope to do the same for people in, you know, people, everybody in this room. I really want to heighten people's beliefs and values and see that in the media and show that to um, everyone in our legislature. <laughs> what advice would you give your younger self? Oh, this is a good one. 
but you are your younger sister. <laughs> <laughs> Way young. I think that was nice for us. That's exactly true. Good question, though, because, it, um, you know, and I think, and especially in kind of this field, too, right? It's so easy to hold ourselves to this kind of standard, this plan that, you know, every, you know, just that you have this strong sense of self accountability. And I think if I could look back and tell myself, you know, one piece of advice, it would be to not take, you know, life necessarily so seriously, because I think that, um, you know, my dad and I were talking about this other day that, um, you know, sometimes life's best surprises come when you least expect it, when, you, when things aren't planned. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things to be excited about and life's always changing. So I think that would be my advice to myself. Yeah, for sure. Okay. My wife's favorite number. Lucky number three. What is one life lesson that you've learned from me, your dad, that has stuck with you, Ian? Yeah. Um, well, so I one thing I do remember is just the insane amount of stories that you've told me of living in the Soviet Union, living abroad, uh, really reporting on the state of democracy in the world. Um, and compared to how you kind of started out, that's not that wasn't necessarily the most direct path. Um, so I think just the biggest lesson, it's kind of cliche, cliche, but if you work hard enough, if you really care about what you're doing, um, the sky's the limit. So huh. <laughs> this is a lot faster. It is. I can I mean certainly, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, ask me now that, you to... that always throws me off. Yeah. Um, right after the other. Okay. So dad, mm -hmm. what is your first memory of public service with me? So my first memory of you in politics, and I guess it was in uh, in public service, was you in my arms as I was introducing you to Barack Obama. <laughs> and you have this picture. And um, and I don't know, this was before the primaries. This was way early uh, when he was running pretty far behind um, Hillary Clinton. And... Um, so he was, you know, he wasn't being rushed the way that he eventually became rushed as he grew in popularity and his success. And what was clear was that he really missed his kids because he was on the trail. And whenever he had a chance to find or see or hold or touch a kid, um, he would do so. And, and so when you and he I, you were looking in his eyes and you guys kind of connected and and he, he said, you know, you're going to be a great citizen. And I thought, okay, well, that's not exactly your first public service <laughs> effort, but it felt like it because it felt like he anointed you to some degree. So, um, I'll take it. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's from Barack Obama's lips. And now his daughter goes to USC. Yeah, so Go get him. He should be here. They should be here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll step out for that one. Yeah. <laughs> All three of us. I'm the next question. Yeah. All right, Dad, number six. Here we go. All right. What is your dream job slash career in politics? Oh, my dream job. But I think the, the trains le left the station, but uh, would have been to be a United States senator. Uh, but now at, at this stage of my career to, uh, to serve on the Board of Regents of the University of California. Be good at that. Arthur, yes. What political <laughs> issues matter most to you, and why? Well, it's funny you ask, Dave. <laughs> um, gosh, do you go, you know, federal? Do you go state? I'll do both. Right? When in doubt, just talk. That's what I do. Um, I, I think. And I, I mean this sincerely at, on the federal level as an assurance that our democracy continues to thrive. I have some genuine concerns about that, but I also believe in our country and the people that live here. So uh, I hope that we don't just take democracy for granted, because sometimes I think it's easy to do. And we just have to strive together as a people, left, right, middle, to, to pursue that goal. Um, on the state level, and I'll even take it down to the Los Angeles level, I've lived in Los Angeles my entire life, almost, give or take six years up in the Bay Area, right by Millbury, I might add. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, our homeless situation down here is is tragic. Um, people, you know, I recently moved into downtown with my wife, 
I take the Metro to work and it's, it's sad because there's so many people who have mental health issues that have drug addiction issues and none of it's really getting resolved. And now, you know, I'm not going around to point fingers, but something's got to start somewhere. Uh, it's not fair to the folks on the street. It's not fair to the people that live around the folks on the street. It's not really fair to anybody. So, you know, I'm not picking and choosing in this next mayoral election, but I just hope it's someone who will do something in a positive way to make Los Angeles the great city it is. Off my stump. And onto your question. Oh, thank you. That yeah, seems to be kind of a problem. Um, all right, Katie. If you could meet any famous political figure, living or dead, I wanted this question, actually. Um, who would you like to meet? Well, I'm very jealous of you, Leon, because I would love to meet Barack Obama. He's somebody that I grew up idolizing and really was like my first kind of introduction into politics with the presidential race in 08. And I, yeah, I would, I would die. That sounds like <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah. Great. My turn? Yeah. Hmm. What's been the most pivotal moment in your career thus far? Okay, good question. Um, I mean, I think undoubtedly would have to be um, serving as student body president here at USC. I think, um, you know, I started out in USG, the undergraduate student government, as a student senator, um, which is a phenomenal experience. Um, obviously, through COVID, became very difficult. And then uh, beginning my term president here, um, you know, during that time coming out of COVID, um, it, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And it was obviously a very fulfilling job. It was a very difficult, very, very difficult job. Um, and I think that it ways that I, you know, never could have for the work that I'm doing now that I'm sure I will take those lessons and um, later on into my career as well. Um, and I think in a lot of ways sort of promoted, you know, this idea that, okay, maybe I should stay, stick around LA and kind of look at local politics here. And so I'm very, very grateful for that opportunity and uh, the, you know, opportunity to do that. So, yeah. Well, thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky 13. Okay. What is one thing you wish for me again in my career? Um, for you and your career. So I am excited for you to be a professor at USC next semester. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's suiting that the last question is. Yeah, about me. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, and I'm just excited to see you down here. I hope you have a really great semester. I think that is the, uh, that would be the pinnacle of your career. Have fun with me at USC next semester. So, that's the last question. I will tell you, speaking from a parent who's got a daughter here, we have tea, coffee, drinks, awesome. whatever, at least every week or two. It's it's that's phenomenal. Right. Okay. He'd make a good first partner too. And I'm going to <laughs> and I'm going to his first gig tonight. So. Yeah, uh, nine thirty, <laughs> sir. Pilot. <laughs> like. Going, guys. Yeah. Keep going, guys. Keep going. You're missing questions. It's okay. All right. All right. Should we mix them up? Yeah, let's mix them up. Let's That'd mix them up. Time. Okay. It works. There you go. Uh, I remember my favorite turn. Right. Oh, is it yours one? No, I I think I asked you that. Or no, maybe somebody else. Anyway. Well, that works. No. Yeah. If I okay. I think. What did you want to be when you grew up? Did you always know you wanted to do something political? Uh, no. So um, growing up, you know, my parents were immigrants. They were refugees to the country. So they really, and they didn't have uh, an opportunity for education. My my dad never went to high school. My wife, my mom uh, finished high school. So when they came to this country, they really only understood two professions. And those were the ones that they interacted with, in, in, you know, doctors and lawyers. And so I had to be either a doctor or a lawyer. And, and so... Um, I found out very quickly that I didn't want to become either of them when I went to college. I didn't like being in hospitals and I certainly didn't understand the appeal back then of being a lawyer. And so um, so shortly after I figured out what I didn't want to be, I figured out that that journalism would be the the, the pathway 
for my future. And so um, that's what I wanted to be. And it worked out. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay. Hopefully. Okay. I don't know. What is one life lesson that you've learned from me that has stuck with you? <laughs> Excellent. I'm excited to hear this one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Ah, um, lots of life lessons. Uh, I mean, um, you know, responsibility, you know, the responsibility of, of being a parent and how that changes your life. I mean, most all of you here, have, you know, it, it would take us another half an hour to go anywhere, you know, right after you were born and the planning that that took and, <laughs> uh, and, and everything else. And uh, um, then, you know, just, just the, the sheer joy of um, of watching you watching you grow up and um, and 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 the pride. But you know, I would also say that, and it's a cliche. It's become a cliche that um, you know you plan, your parents plan, and God laughs. <laughs> and you know, it's 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 true. You know, all our best. as uh, as as best we know how and uh, then at some point make good decisions and um, Alexis I'm very proud of you yeah thanks Doc. what sparked your initial interest in politics uh, well, I sort of already mentioned my mom to a large degree, but the truth is I never planned on getting into politics. Uh, my dad was a lawyer. Um, he was your class. This is going to sound terrible. He was an ambulance chaser. He was a, he was a tort lawyer um, up in the Bay Area, and his passion was not the law. Uh, the law was a means to an end for him. He, he loved jazz, so he opened up a small jazz club in, in the Bay Area in the 50s and 60s, and um, and he ran that until, unfortunately, passed when I was very young. And my mom always reminded me, sort of whispering in my ear, you're going to be a lawyer one day. You're going to be a lawyer one day. And then there's that moment that I think most people have sort of mid-high school. I, I'm going to be a lawyer. I wonder what that really means. Um, but it's, you know, it. I started out my career at the California Attorney General's office. So I was a prosecutor for 10 years. And that certainly had political implications. And I think the longer I was there and, and dealing with, you know, very heavy duty issues, you know, part of my job was to prosecute death penalty cases. That's what I did. Um, you know, it just sort of reinvigorated my interest in politics to really think about it more systemically, I think. Um, um, had the opportunity, you know, I was there for 10 years. It was great. I love my job. But if I had to do it for another 20, I would have hated myself. So, uh, you know, I shifted to academia and sort of combined my former career as a prosecutor with politics and public law and, and judicial decision making, which is what I teach here. So it, it's been a nice melding of the two. I left the law before I got to hate it, which I think is also quite nice. Um, I am not a huge cheerleader for law school. I think people, I tell students, go to law school if you have a purpose. Don't go to law school to start collecting degrees. It's too expensive now. When I went to Pepperdine, it was 16 grand a year. Now it's probably 80 grand a year, maybe more. Who knows? So um, I, I think one of the values is that I can pass that on to my students and give them some perspective. And some students I talk out of law school, some I talk into law school. So there you go. I was talked out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back we go. AT. Who are your political heroes? I think you asked me that one. So. My political heroes. I would honestly have to say Hillary Clinton. And I know she's a bit controversial and she had a really interesting campaign, but she learned how to, I, I don't know, kind of colloquial, but like take all the hate and really keep going and persevere through her career, accepting the change in media, in person, when she's debating. And keep going and she truly did she went and she tried her best and she may not have succeeded but she might be happier at the end of the day is it fair enough <laughs> sorry i'm like cheering my daughter <laughs> <laughs> it's allowed 
Alexis, if you could meet one famous political figure, living or dead, who would you like to meet? Easy. And I think if I had the choice to meet, yeah, one political figure, dead or alive, would definitely have to be Robert Kennedy. I think most people who know me know that I have kind of a bit of an obsession with the guy. Um, yeah, it just obviously um, came into public life at a very um, kind of divisive and um, polarizing time, I think, in our country's history. And um, he's really a figure of, that promoted a lot of change. And I just admire him a lot. So um, he gave me that quote, Dad. I still wake up to it every morning. I, I yeah, it's a, it's a great quote from um, a speech that Kennedy gave uh, to the students at UC Berkeley. About, you get a chance, you, you know, got to look it up. Yeah, and if you have time, look it up. It's, it's Robert Kennedy at, at Berkeley about, um, you know, living on an island of privilege and what you do with your talents and how you use them and how you feel about that upon reflecting upon your life. And I put it on all my kids' walls and, uh, you know, hopefully they read it once in a while. When I got to Alexis's apartment last night, I noticed it up on the wall and I got a big happy feeling. So. <laughs> So, well, Hillary Clinton's big in our family, and Governor Newsom's favorite political figure is, in fact, Robert Kennedy. So you can share that with the governor. All right, Ian, uh, you get to think about what you were like younger and uh, give you that, that younger self some advice. So as the youngest person here, I definitely have a platform <laughs> to stand on. Uh, <laughs> I think two things. One, I'd probably tell myself to eat breakfast in the morning, just today. I'm kind of hungry. Um, and, then the second, <laughs> and then the second thing, I don't know. Again, I think don't take life so seriously. It's just such an important thing to do. I obviously grew up um, in international politics. I grew up in an embassy. I grew up with my mom being the lieutenant governor and my dad having all these stories of working as a foreign correspondent. And throughout all that, I've been a musician. I've been focused on music, and I am studying uh, GIS uh, as well as everything else I'm doing at USC. So I think that you can't let yourself be contained by any particular you know, path that you see for yourself in life um, or just blindly follow the footsteps of someone else. Um, so luckily, my dad was actually the one who got me into music, um, and my mom has been supporting me. She's actually coming to my show tonight. So. <laughs> Um, again, the offer is <laughs> surf club. That's right. 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 It's going to be a time. Um, so yeah, I think I think I'm I'm really happy with the way my life has gone so far, and I'm looking forward to the rest of it. Thank you. And I have to choose a question. So there goes my. Who has been the most influential person in your career, Dad? Um. Well, you know, it's I, I'd say that a, one one journalist, but also some of the people that I've covered or have befriended, right? And so, in my career, I'd say it was Rod Nordland, who was the is the New York Times correspondent. He's, he's not well these days, but he was the Rome bureau chief at the time when I was first working for in in Rome. And he taught me all kinds of things, like how not to write down bribes on my expense account, you know, and things, <laughs> things of that sort that really were important for New York to understand or not understand. But but I'd say probably more important in my career were people who were not in my profession, but those who I either got to know or who I covered. And I, I break them down to three people. One was Václav Havel, who I got to know during the revolution and then got to know during my two years living in Prague. An amazing man, just heroic in in every in every way. Uh, another is somebody you know and who's uh, still a friend, Leopoldo Lopez. Yeah. Leopoldo um, ran for uh, president, uh, but was knocked out of the presidency uh, and put into jail and into solitary confinement in Venezuela, and lives in exile in Spain right now. And the third person was somebody I met last um, September, who I know you all know. In one way, my wife and I spent the better part of half a day with him in uh, California because um, his country's military trained with the California National Guard, and that's uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. And I think there is no more inspiration currently in this world today than that single individual, both in my career and in my life. 
Oh no, that's right. I thought we were going around. <laughs> I'm just so excited. <laughs> more cars, more yes. cars. <laughs> Dad, what was your first job in politics? My first job in politics, I was student body president at uh, at my college. Wow, like that was, and uh, you know, it was interesting because there are a lot of there are a lot of truisms that follow. Um, I could probably count all my detractors on one hand. Uh, and then you put your name on the ballot and run for office and all of a sudden, half, you know, the, school hates half you. the people, they don't hate you, no, but they but disagree you know, with you or they find a yeah. reason not to like you and they don't vote for you. And it's, and it's been true. I've run 21 times, 118. You try to forget about the other three, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's, it's been true in every race. What was your first memory of public service with me? Oh gosh. Um, I mean, it's, I remember a lot of beach cleanups uh, when you were, when we were kids, right? I mean, um, doing activities like that, doing, um, you know, things through our church, um, helping out people, food, canned food drives. Um, we were fortunate that Katie went to a, a, a very small elementary school that really promoted sort of good human beings over ABCs. ABCs are always going to be learned, but it was really about sort of, you know, helping out others. And I, I think that has, I think, had a positive influence on on our whole family. You know, I ended up being on that school board for about a dozen years because of their their viewpoint and, and models. So that's simple things, but things that I certainly remember. Well, guys, we've done two rounds of these questions. It's been super special just to watch it. I, I mean, oh, my heart is full. Uh, but we're going to have a time for one more round. And this is one question all of you will get, right? And so this is a question that's very USC specific. This is Trojan Family Weekend. So we wanted to end on a Trojan note. And so the question for all of you, and I'll start with you, Katie, is what role has USC played in your political life? And you can expand it to your life in general if you like. All right, so I'm sure all of you are very excited for Saturday's game. I have not missed a single Trojan football season, except for the pandemic, and when I studied abroad in London. And growing up with SC, I couldn't be more grateful for values it has given me as a school, but also as a person. And it's been my whole life. Cardinal and blood, or Card 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 <laughs> Card 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 <laughs> my blood. And I am very grateful for what my parents have endowed me with. And um, in terms of politics, um, just being exposed through the um, Center for Political Future, they bring in speakers all the time. Um, I can thank Nicole Pompilio. I don't know where she is, but yeah, where? Where? <laughs> shout out to my girl who actually helped me get my internship in political consulting. And without her help, I wouldn't have been able to do it. And I love visiting her and my dad every once a week, and I couldn't be more thankful. Awesome. Um, I think obviously in, in so many ways, like obviously my time in undergraduate student government, I, I think I, I, I learned a lot as I was mentioning before, but at a school like USC as well, as you meet people, I mean, the people that you meet at this university is unlike anything you will find anywhere else in the world. People from all over with just so many different experiences and um, from so many different backgrounds. And I think I've learned some of the most just from the individuals that I've crossed paths with at, from my time at USC. Um, the exposure, I mean, you know, the speakers that we see at this university, many of which I think are brought in by CPF, um, anything from you know, Pete Buttigieg, Gray Davis, um, ama amazing people, I, I think continues to inspire. Um, and, you know, I've, I've learned so much from that as well. But um, fun fact too, I think that CPF was actually the first real exposure that I had at USC from the Sorrell Summit um, down in Sacramento, up in Sacramento and was kind of what really sparked my interest in the University of Southern California. And so without that, without having attended that event, I don't know that I would probably be at this point now. So I'm very, very grateful to CPF for sure. 
Yeah, so I think the, the biggest thing for me so far is that I'm currently living under my mother my mother's uh, jurisdiction in yeah. California. <laughs> so definitely location's a big one. But that, that really allows me to be active in both uh, her campaign and what she's been doing uh, just in the area. And something that I really didn't thought I'd think that, something that I think, didn't think I would be doing, uh, having lived in San Francisco my whole life. Uh, beyond that, uh, I can't say I've really had much of a political career myself yet as a sophomore in college. Um, but I'm definitely able to take the lessons that my parents have taught me and kind of further uh, really understand what, what they are and what they mean in my international relations classes, talking to my professors, my fellow students, like these guys right here. Um, so yeah, USC has just been such an incredible opportunity for me so far. It's really helped me develop my own uh, knowledge of the world that we live in. So um, Ian mentioned that, Ian mentioned that I uh, were from Northern California and I think you grow up with this real misunderstanding of how the Southland works and, and what what makes it up because it's so hard to comprehend, especially if you're up there. And then of course, we had these sports rivalries, which made it uh, you know almost adversarial to have any sort of affection for Southern California. And we and, take your water. Yeah, and so <laughs> and whatever, you know, all of that, right? And so um, I had lived in many great cities in the world, but I had never lived in the great city of Los Angeles. And so when I got the, um, the fellowship to come down here to Annenberg, it really opened up an understanding and the beginning of an understanding of really one of the truly great modern cities in the world. And, and those of you who live here know what I'm talking about, what, com what comprises that greatness. But the, but the Trojan specific uh, aspect of it that it opened up my world in politics was that the fellowship was an international fellowship and it focused on Latin America. So within that, during that year, I got to spend um, some time learning Spanish in Guatemala. We had formal uh, exchange and I spent a couple of weeks in Cuba. And then uh, I actually spent the entire summer in Mexico City at the Colegio de Mexico. And I mentioned that program because it really opened up Latin America and the Spanish speaking world to me. And that wouldn't have happened. And so part of the reason why Leopoldo is a friend is that I now have this understanding and appreciation for the Spanish speaking world, politically, economically, and otherwise. I've had time to, to, to think about to think about the question. And uh, for some reason, I zero it in on Jess Unra, you know, who the program is, is, is named for. And, and, and Jess graduated from USC. And Jess was the father of the modern day legislature, um, one of the greatest speakers of any legislature in this in this country and he had a profound effect on me i got to spend a lot of time with him um, he was the state treasurer uh, and he had all of us freshman legislators it was a reapportionment year and we got a lot of attention and he had us all to the treasurer's office and he ended the explanation of what he did by saying you know i've been in this business a long time if any of you ever need any help or advice or something you know i'm i'm available so about three weeks later i had this problem and if I went this way, I got killed. If this, you know, if it went the other way, I got impeached, you know. And and so uh, I called over to his office and asked if he was available. I wanted to make an appointment. And his secretary said, well, just wait a minute. The next thing I know, he's on the phone. And I said, well, I want to make an appointment to see. He said, well, what are you doing right now? And he said, come on over. And so I explained to him what the problem was. And he laid back, closed his eyes, opened them and looked at me and he said, what would happen if you just didn't do anything? <laughs> and I've drawn on that experience. <laughs> sometimes there are problems that just aren't ready to be solved. And it's, you know, it's so true, so true in life. And then, um, and, and then beyond that, California Strategies has always worked closely as long as we've been around with, with USC. And we've collaborated with them on various programs and sponsored them. And then one of the other things I'm really thankful for is we went to the state rival across town that was Alexis's and my first college visit and she liked it and we came here and she said dad we can cancel the other eight trips <laughs> because this is it I want to go here tough on my wallet but well worth it <laughs> <laughs> that's great um I mean you know USC has been really the opportunity to um, engage with a population whose mind is not closed off and that is a wonderful, I love being challenged by 
young minds and different perspectives. And sometimes I realize just um, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, it's just given me the opportunity, not just to work with students that are, are phenomenally brilliant, um, but also the exposure through the Center for the Political Future, you know, to work with people like, you know, Bob Shrum and Mike Murphy. And, you know, we all come from sort of different angles and perspectives, but we all have the same goal, which is let's make this country work just a little bit better or a lot of it better. So I want to thank Kami for what he does. He works tirelessly at his job, and I don't think he gets enough kudos um, for panels like this. So thank you, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, to our audience who's watching on YouTube, live streamed on Facebook, and who are watching on Zoom, thank you for joining us today. We heard a lot about a lot of different things that we'll call Trojan values, and those include the power of listening, right? It, that was an amazing exercise we just witnessed, the power of empathy, power of love, uh, and I, and so many other lessons. But I want to end with what you just said, Arthur, power of gratitude. So grateful to you all for joining us today for this. This is a very special. These are This is not a normal panel. And it felt very special. So thank you super much. Hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your coming weekend. Thank you to our panel. <laughs>